Hello everyone, welcome to Dakota. This is a horror adventure game. It takes place in a motel on Christmas Eve in 1962 in Dakota, Minnesota. It tells the story of an unsolved case, narrated by the only survivor of that night. It was created in a month for the December 2013 MAGS competition, and it is completely free to play. I'll have a link to where you can play it for yourself in the description. I want to thank one of my viewers, David, for telling me about this game, because otherwise I might have missed it. And, as is usual with my playstyle, I'm going to go slow, take my time, and I like to analyze things a bit, especially towards the end. The only other thing I want to do before I press start is get in the mood of it. So let's take a couple seconds and just listen to the sound of the falling rain and the, the faint buzz of these flickering lights. Alright, I think I'm ready. Twenty fourth of December, nineteen sixty two, Dakota, Minnesota. I can't believe how much bullshit and fiction has circulated about them events in that motel on Christmas Eve. I was a corporal back then. I believe my second year in Dakota. I still remember when I was sent to investigate and report immediately. One man dead by a six-bullet revolver. Any reasonable man would have categorized this as a hit-and-run. I know I should have. But I found seven darn bullets on the body. The shots were not apart, and everyone witnessed that they barely separated each other. Had I not bothered with the extra bullet, the other five tenants of the motel would have been alive. Ah, shit. <laughs> Jeremy was. As far as I can recall, it was around 24. He was unfortunately shot a little after I called a gathering at the reception. Yeah, I heard you, Liz. Give me a minute. Let's go through the door. Just a second, though. Let's take a look around the environment. Heater. It's the only thing that's going to keep you warm this night. Seems comfy, though with recent events, sleeping seems unlikely. You wonder how this television is still working, in the horrible state it's in. I'm also wondering why there's nothing to sit on in front of the TV. Do you just, like, watch TV from your bed from a very awkward angle? Very strange setup you have here, man. It's a telephone. Typical historic books. All right, who's there? Oh. A bullet to the face. He was a drug addict, so nobody gave two fucks about him, really. His parents didn't even bother to show at the funeral. Didn't come easy on them. Their son was a parasite of society. Elizabeth Block, age 34. By the time she was murdered, I had already interviewed every witness, including her. Except, of course, Mr. Waz. Since they were somewhat close, he used to be her student, I sent her to find... Uh, to find what was stalling Mr. Waz, not being aware that he was dead at the time. And I was sending her to die. Waz's room was at the end of the corridor, and the door leading to the reception was next to the stairs. Lighter. Why is there a lighter on the bench? Alright, well I guess, um, spoiler, I guess we know what's gonna happen. 
<laughs> She's gonna die when she gets there. I'm assuming the murderer is still there. End of the hallway. Let's do everything else first. Leads back to the reception. But you need to find Jeremy first. It's a sign portraying various celebrities that have stayed in this hotel. You only take interest after seeing Cherry Darling. It appears to be a lighter. Someone must have misplaced it. Ooh, scrap it. You pick up the lighter. Hmm. Where's my inventory? Also, I should probably save it, I guess. I don't seem to have an inventory. I guess it just... I guess maybe you don't use items on the environment. You just have them and they do stuff. The, st the stairs lead to the terrace, but the door is padlocked. Hmm. All right, Jeremy. I'm coming. <sighs> oh, great. The power's out. Well, I do have the lighter, but... I... Is there any way I can use it? I'm not seeing it up here. Nothing down here. Hmm. I guess maybe this is me using it. Yeah, maybe this is me using it. I'm not sure. Anyway. It's very, very quiet. Room 5D. That's not the room you're looking for. Room 3D. That's not the room you're looking for. Nope. Oh, this is Jeremy's room. Alright, there's no one outside. Jeremy? Hey. Hello? Oh god, I have to investigate it? <sighs> it sounded like it was coming from right here. Can I just go inside the room? I guess that's a no. Elizabeth. What the fuck? Well, it could have been Jeremy. He's dead. I think it's time to run. Right now. Time to get to reception. You try and you try, but the door won't budge. Oh, fuck. Stairs? It's padlock. <clears throat> oh, God. <coughs> Mrs. Block inexplicably booked a room in the same motel as her former student. It was obvious that this was not a mere coincidence. The connection between her and Jeremy Waz came a long way. Especially regarding the incidents that occurred on the summer of 1956. And at that time, in the night, I was the only one alive in the motel. The last two victims were laying in front of me, and I had to figure out. Figure out the trail of bodies that has left me in a state of utter bedazzlement and fear. I was not going to leave this room until I found answers. Alright, what have we got here? RBTL computer, what the hell is that? 
Operate machinery. You take a look at the screen. Oh my, that is very large. Oops, I just skipped to the end. Okay. Let's dive into it. Okay. It's time to talk about this openly and solve this. We've all received threatening calls. I've suggested taking matters to the, to the police, but everyone is against the idea. Frankly, I think it's for our best interest to let professionals handle this. The uh, Summer of 59 incident doesn't have to be revealed in any way. It's been four years now that we're getting those messages. Shauna is scared, and I'm scared for Shauna. She's not a bad person. She's changed a lot. It's a shame for her past demons to follow her. I'm planning on marrying her once this is over. Alright, this is the day after. We've reached the motel in Dakota. It appears that we're the first to get here. Shauna is slowly turning into a nervous breakdown. Alright, this is next day. A great day to be alive. I made breakfast for Shauna, but she's still sleeping as I write this. I hope today she'll feel better. Once again the next day. The others have arrived. Only missing... Hague? Hog? Not sure how to pronounce that. He'll get here. Sean is here, and the chance of seeing her again is something he won't miss. Even that junkie is here. Frankly, he should be the only one justice should be inflicted on. I can't wait for all of this to be over. This next day. Shauna is still in bed. I'm getting worried. She's throwing up a lot as well as uh, throwing up a lot as well today. We haven't traded words. Jeff came to our room to see her. She felt all kinds of uncomfortable. It's funny how everything resulted into the incident being covered back then. The teacher was dating the junkie, the cop. Jeff was fucking my Shauna, who in her turn was fucking that poor kid for money. Old Shauna could drag him wherever she wanted. He was madly in love with her. I honestly hope the father will just stick to threats. Wait, so the teacher was dating the junkie? Cop, Shauna... Mm -hmm. Well, that's one hell of a mess. Jesus. We've decided to gather in our room. I've brought a table from the main hall, and we're sitting by Shauna's bed. Shauna's condition is a bit alarming, really. It worries me too much. Today she got up for a while. She spent her day staring outside the window. How many times I wished Shauna wasn't involved into the drowning of that kid. If they hadn't gone into the park, that junkie wouldn't have stolen her purse, and that kid would be alive now. Thankfully, Sheriff Hog, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, and Mrs. Locke covered up for their partners, but the threatening messages indicate that the father knows. Sorry for the absence. The discussions take long and are tiring me. We have reached no conclusive decision. However, new heartwarming evidence has come to life. It appears that the, that, uh, the father has recently passed away. A month ago, actually, so we're being threatened by delayed mails. We'll stay some days here to celebrate Christmas, and we'll all be on our merry way. Can't even begin to say how great my mood is. Shauna is still sick in bed. Throwing up. I'm going to call for a doctor later today. Her mood has changed for the better, though. That's something. Oh god, I can't keep my joy. Shauna is bearing a child in her. I'm going to be a father. We're going to keep this secret from the others. There's nothing and no one I'm not going to protect Shauna and our baby from. A lot of info to take in here. Victim number two. Let's examine the body. Let's read the backstory. Anthony Muldoon. A goddamn fucking reporter. Not a very good one. 
and I hated his guts for a long time now. Examine it. This is the second body in this room. Examining the position of said body and the skid marks on the floor, it appears the victim dragged... dragged himself... here. The body was initially shot in the stomach near the door. The wound was fatal, however left the victim alive for a while. Newspapers. Let's look at them closer. A collection, collage if you will, of torn newspapers, headlines and articles. They're all circulating the same event. You decide to read a random one. Boy drowns in lake. Body retrieved from lake? A little too late. Alright, so they're all about the boy drowning. Let's take them off the wall. You refrain from doing so. Alright, let's not do that. Victim number one. Backstory. That's the half of the couple lying dead. Shauna Lod, a blonde prostitute from St. Charles. She used to take shop in Dakota some years ago when her mom rented a house here. But she recently moved back to St. Charles. Guess the business was blooming there. A man-eater, she would go near the school to tempt younger boys to spend all of their allowance on her. Examine the victim. You take a closer look. Poor soul is lying in a pool of blood and hopes gone astray. A bullet wound, located in the chest, appears to be the source of the hemorrhage. Especially focusing on the bullet wound, you realize she was shot in the back. Hypothesis. The victim, Shauna Laud, was brutally shot three times in the back. Let's touch the covers. You pull the covers to the lower part of the bed, revealing the lifeless body. You turn the body to the right, revealing a bullet hole in the bed mattress. It appears to be that all evidence leads to the murderer shooting from beneath the bed. Your stomach fails to bear the sight for any longer. You pull the covers up. Under the bed. Shot her in the back from under the bed. Blood stains. Let's look at them. Taking a long, hard look at the stains, you attempt to make something of them. This is clearly not blood from this victim. I can touch them? <laughs> Do I want to? The blood is not dry, indicating the events in this room took place recently. Okay. Alright, what else is here? Victim blood stains. I think that might be it. Can I take the news the newspapers now? No. Oh, hold on. Should probably save. Let's leave. Not until this is resolved. Okay, what have I missed? Second body in this room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dragged himself. I read everything from here. Oh, bed. I don't think I examined the bed. Look under bed. Slowly, you peek to make sure there's no one under the bed. Are these separate blood stains? Nope. I think that's everything. Can I read other ones? Look closer. 
tragedy in Dakota. Schoolboy loses his life after accidentally falling in lake. Devastated father claims this to be a cover-up. Black Summer for young Trevor Watkins' family. Father of child loses his mind after some tragic after son's tragic loss. We can only ever hope that the state will do its best to take this matter under control. Anymore? Family loses another. Gerald Walken. After deemed to be schizophrenic, it gets locked in a psychiatrist, uh, psychiatric ward to spend at least two years under surveillance. All these are written by Anthony Muldoon. Oh, the reporter. This guy. Hmm. All right. Not until this is resolved. What? What am I missing? Do I keep reading them? Mm -hmm. All written by Anthony Muldoon. Mm -hmm. Still can't take them. Haven't I done everything? Backstory. Mm -hmm. She was shot while whilst lying in bed. The perpetrator is hiding underneath the bed. Mm. It appears that the perpetrator is avenging the death of that kid. Yep. And he murdered both tenants. Most likely because Muldoon was trying to protect Shauna Lod, or the journalist was also a target. Articles written by Muldoon were the reason Walken was sent to a psychiatric ward. The way the perpetrator's bleeding, chances are he won't go far. There we go. A year later, some fishermen found a body near the river, along with a revolver. After the ballistic report, the weaponry was connected to the murders. Justine Walken, the mother of the child, was identified through dental records. Her child accidentally drowned after hunting down a common thief that stole the purse of Shauna Laud. She was also known as Dakota, a prostitute at the time. In order to avoid troubles and get arrested, Dakota convinced Hogg, or whatever his name is, a cop, to cover this up. Same thing occurred at the school, as Elizabeth Bullock, the principal in that summer, covered up any trace leading to Jeremy Waz, as they had an affair back then, and it would be revealed. Waz dropped out of school and ended up a junkie from his guilts. The Walkins had fallen entirely apart. Especially after journalist Anthony Muldoon tried to shut Walkins' father, Walkins' father's mouth by implying that his mental condition was unstable, requiring psychiatric evaluation. Thus, Mrs. Walken lost both the son and her husband. When she started her killing spree, she shot Hogg six times with a revolver, but he shot her once as well. That was the extra shot. The wound slowly started bleeding, resulting in her death. Thinking about how the incidents that night affected my career and life. I'm glad I never got around to solve this case. Officially. We should forgive our enemies, but not before they are hanged. <laughs> oh, that's uplifting. Well, that was quite good. I liked it. 
It was a little bit hard to deal with all of the strange grammar and spelling mistakes. I... I misread some things, but most of the weird phrases were just because the game was written strangely and I was trying to correct them to make sense in my mind and was a little bit difficult. But other than that, I mean, other than the spelling mistakes, that was really good. Yeah. It's got some really good art. Especially the opening scene. And this scene here too, just some really nice weather effects, especially the rain in the beginning. I don't know if anyone noticed, but in the beginning there was rain falling down, just kind of in general. But then there's also rain specifically dripping off of roofs and stuff like that, which looked really cool. And here you can see the snow. So, yeah, really good looking. Uh, the sound was... Uh, the sound was okay. It was a little bit barren. I would have liked more kind of ambient tracks. Sometimes it was too quiet. But, yeah, the sound was pretty good. And it's a creepy and... short little horror tale. About a horrible series of events. Thievery and... Lying and covering up and murder sprees in a broken family. Yep. Condensed little tale of tragedy. More sad than anything else. Alright, well that's all I can think of to mention. So, hopefully you enjoyed my playthrough of Dakota, and thank you for watching.